course, I had to help him pass the course. <laughs> and I'll tell you something. Uh, it's good to be here, and uh, I like to do this informal. If, if most of you that have been here before just ask a question, because I cover a lot of stuff. So if you see something that you you want to ask about, then just raise your hand, and I'll call on you. Uh, but some neat stuff happening over. Uh, most of you see the terrible thing about Notre Dame Cathedral today? I think it burned up, uh, which, is, which is terrible. But when I saw the news, it was on fire so bad you couldn't put it out. Uh, century old, I think during the uh, 1200s is when it was built. It's a devastating event. But we're going to talk about Scotland and we're going to talk about the relationship of Scotland and the, uh, the, the land and the people and the area and how, how we compare and how we have such similarities here. Uh, Bruce, go ahead. We're going to talk about uh, Scotland and of course an early name for Scottish things was Caledonia and the Caledonia Orogeny and some of those uh, many references to Scotland were Caledonia. Uh, which is the Latin name given to it by the Romans to the land north of the province of Britannia, beyond the frontier of the empire, roughly corresponding to modern day Scotland. And the name was a Celtic source, and it's also a romantic or a poetic name for Scotland. But when we talk about the Caledonian orogeny, the mountain building, it, 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 it includes more than just Scotland, and we'll cover that in just a second. Next, Bruce. But there's Britannia, Hibernia, we all know that's Ireland, and Caledonia. Um, and then we're going to talk about Hadrian's Wall. Uh, how many have been to Scotland? Okay, this is good. How many have been to Hadrian's Wall? Why did the Romans build Hadrian's Wall? Keep the, keep the invading Scotland, Scottish people out because they were pesty. And they couldn't beat them. They couldn't. They were too. They were fearful fighters, and the Romans couldn't deal with them. So they built a wall, and they put little forts all along to keep the Scottish Scotland people out from raiding into the Roman province, the Roman areas of, of England. But guess what? The Scots people found the places where they couldn't see them, and they still went in and out. Next slide. But the Highlands is a historic region of Scotland. Culturally, the Highlands and the Lowlands diverged from the later Middle Ages into the modern period when Lowland Scots replaced Scottish Gaelic throughout most of the Lowlands. The term is also used for the area north and west of the Highland boundary fall. Although the exact boundaries are not clearly defined, particularly to the, to the east. Next slide. But what this this is so similar to our mountains because. We call it the escarpment. Uh, when you're coming up from Marion, you start climbing the mountain, that's the escarpment, and that is the Brevard Fault. Uh, the Brevard Fault is an old fault named after Brevard, and then it goes down to Cartersville, Georgia, and it's renamed the Cartersville Fault, and that fault is basically the edge of the Piedmont and the western Piedmont to the Blue Ridge. In Scotland, you have, let's go back to that side, you have the Highland Boundary Fall. So this is, this is where their mountains start. And they have something similar in the lowlands as our Piedmont. And then they even have a coastal plain over in this area. So lots of things are similar. But when, when you approach their mountains, it's very much like approaching our mountains from Marion or McDowell County. Next slide. But this is the Highland Boundary is a major fault that crosses across Scotland. It separates two distinctly different physiographic and geological terrains, uh, the Highlands and the Lowlands. And of course, that's also where their waterfalls start, and that's as far as you can come up in a boat. Just like the, the uh, coastal plain, the coastal plain of North Carolina, when you hit the Blue Ridge, that's about, when you hit the Piedmont, that's about as far as you can come up in a boat because that's where you start to get waterfalls and, and shallow creeks. Next slide, Cruz. And again, there's the Highland Fault there, and these are the areas of, of North Scotland and some of the areas of uh, the, the mountains around this area. 
but just a beautiful place. And most of you, when you visited Scotland, did you go to the Highlands? Did you go there in particular? Okay, next slide through. But this is what it looks like. Um, you're traveling along and then you hit these majestic mountains. Um, very similar to, to the Blacks. Uh, uh, very similar physiographic and topographical episodes there. The, the, the very, very similar to what we have. And just such a beautiful country. Next slide. As populations grew, the lowlands were more able to support rise, more adaptable to the agricultural changes and demographic increase necessitated. Power then centralized around Edinburgh, shifting the focus of the realm south and east, and to a certain extent alienating and almost ignoring the north and west. And this is important. This is why I put this in red. As a result, the highlands with a limited agricultural scope due to unforgiving and harsh landscapes and climate, where the people adopt, adapted a certain social structure and warlike existence, in order to survive, got somehow frozen in time. Gaelic and nature of Highland customs and dress became seen from the point of view. The South is a backward anachronism and its warrior lifestyle was bitterly feared. Kind of sound like our mountains. Kind of sound like our people. Uh, the, uh, how many in here are natives, and I mean natives, of Metro Nancy Avery County? Oh, that's good. You're tough people. Uh, and, and most of the, the ones that came here were either trying to get away from something, or they didn't like government, or they were protesting something, or they wanted to be left alone. Uh, same thing here in Scotland. And of course, those people, uh, when certain things happened and, and, and government was bothering them, they wanted to get away and go to another place that was similar to home. Next slide, Bruce. Okay, that's it. People of Appalachia, and, and just remember the last slide. People of Appalachia can be traced back to a migration of Scots Irish settlers that moved to the colonies between 1720 and 1775. The Scotch Irish immigrants also dealt with discrimination and as a result headed west until they found the Appalachian Mountains, which reminded them of the mountains regions from which they originated. So they too were trying to, a lot of them came into Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York, and eventually came down a lot of the Appalachians, particularly in this area, the Southern Appalachians. Next slide. The Highlands of Scotland comprise almost one half the land, but only about 5% of the population. In comparison, Western North Carolina is home to about 15% of the population of North Carolina. So not a whole lot. The 18 counties of Western North Carolina contain about a million people. North Carolina for a total, a total contains about 13.8 million people. And of course, that's why we see people running around with these on their cars. How many of you have one of those on your car? All right. Good. Thank you, Dan. Good. Next slide. And of course, when you, when you go through the towns in Edinburgh and uh, we were we were there as a as a uh, as a learning group. It was a forum on the geology of industrial minerals. So we were in Scotland for ten days, working and getting paid to do that. What an awesome experience! Um, just to, to be there and learn the the rocks and the things that were happening. And we were there as guests of the government. So we stayed at St Andrews uh, in St Andrews and stayed in the dorms in St. Andrews and right out my window was a, an old golf course. Uh, we're talking about it. Anybody watch golf yesterday? Okay, it was pretty good. Next slide. But this, the, these buildings are centuries old and centuries uh, 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 and they display so much of the wealth that Britain had. Um, and when they built, they built they, they, they didn't spare any expense in the architecture. Next slide. This is my wife, Debbie, and this is in St. Andrews next to one of the cathedrals. I wish I remembered the name of that one. Next slide. This is that old golf course. <laughs> What's 
the name of that old golf course? Yes, yes. And and I, I hear the British Open, and somebody told me the British Open was going to be there soon. Um, but just, uh, this was right outside of our window, and this was where, of course, where the golf was invented. It was invented. And listening to all those people yesterday cheering for Tiger Wood, it, it, got, it was very popular. Next slide. And there's, that's their clubhouse. How many people have been in the Grassy Creek clubhouse? <laughs> How many people been in that clubhouse? No? <laughs> good, good, good. Next slide. Are you members there? Yes. Oh, you are? Okay. <laughs> okay. And then, of course, as you travel, we started out in Northern England and then we went into Scotland and spent most of the time in Scotland looking at the geology there. But no passport needed. Of course, you have to get get want to get over there, but when you go back and forth from Scotland to England, no passport needed. And the signs are just on a rock. I kept looking for where's where's the big green sign when you come into Scotland from England? It's, it's on this rock. And of course we're going to talk about these right here. These rock walls are everywhere. Everywhere. Because after centuries of farming, what do you do when you Listen, when you're farming your field, what do you do with the rocks in the field? Build a wall or throw them in the pot. Next, next slide. And of course, there we are. There's the England side. Guess what's on the, written on the other side of that rock? You guessed it. Okay, next slide. And then again, there's the other side of that rock. It's just, just a neat, neat, neat place. Next. But we were there uh, with the British Geological Society. This is Dr. George Love and, and Dr. Peter Scott, and they ran the program, and the geology of Scotland is very, very similar to the Appalachians because it's almost the same. It's almost the same. Same rock, same minerals, uh, same physiography, same just about everything. It's just amazing. So you wonder, well, where, where did this come from? Where did this, how could these be so similar? Next slide. This was our group, and uh, you, you couldn't miss us. <laughs> but in, 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 in Europe, uh, whenever uh, you're with a mining company, and it's starting to happen here, how many of you have been in Spruce Pine or in Baker's and you've seen these guys walking around with green coats on? That's starting to happen here. Uh, Unimon, which is now Sabelco, they do it, and they require it, and so does Quartz Corp used to be KT Felsmar and Felsmar Corporation. But the Europeans, they do the pants too. So at some point, you'll be in McDonald's and Spruce Pine and these orange guys will probably come in. But over there, you have, this is the way you dress if you're in a mine. And if you're visiting a mine, this is the way you dress. But these people are from all over the world, mainly the U.S., and they're, they're all seasoned professional geologists. Next slide, Bruce. And these, these are the girls. This one's especially a character. And you can tell. That's my wife, Debbie. Uh, but they go, to, they go to some of the spousal programs and they, they see the really neat stuff. We're looking at dirt and rocks. <laughs> They're looking at buildings and cathedrals and churches. Next slide. But this is, these are some of the highlands as, uh, as you approach. Next slide. And of course, you see these little boogers everywhere, everywhere. And in some places, they aren't even, they aren't in an enclosure, right? In a fence, they're out the road. Uh, and you, you need to watch where you're going because you'll be going and there's sheep, right? Right, right, right in the road. Uh, when y'all were in, in Scotland, did you see any sheep? Okay, next slide. And of course, there's the mountains, and sometimes it's foggy. Next slide. And aren't these beautiful mountains? This is our mountain. This is our mountain. Where is that? Little Gorge. Thought it was Scotland, didn't you? <laughs> That's Little Gorge. This is from Table Rock. This is from Table Rock, looking off in the Little Gorge. And if you've not been to Table Rock, Parked in that little parking lot out there, walk to the top of Table Rock, 
you that have missed living here? How many have been on top of table rock? Boy, there's a lot of shame on you in here. <laughs> You've got to go. It's not a bad walk, and you get up there, and it's just like being in Scotland. If you took the trees off, if you took the trees off and planted grass, it'd be very, very similar. And guys, that's in your backyard. In your backyard. And it's fruit. It's fruit. <laughs> Next slide. Where's this? That's. Let them go work. And somebody almost said it right. These are the chimneys. These are the chimneys. Wiseman's View is right over here. Lake James is right down here. And Marion's over here. Um, very, very similar topography in your backyard. Next slide. And of course you see the rock buildings and the rock walls. And just places that are just so picturesque. Uh, and I think all of you that have been there remember these images. Just a beautiful, beautiful country. Um, sometimes I think, how how did somebody leave that and come over here? Uh, but conditions, of course, were different back then. And of course, these are the, wa the walls, and the walls are just everywhere you go because they picked up rocks from those fields. And so I started looking for walls, and I found this one. Anybody know where that is? Charles and Mary, you have to be quiet. <laughs> Anybody ever been up in King Cove? In Bakersfield? That's Charles and Mary Wilson's wall. Charles, tell us who built that wall. Great great grandfather. Great great grandfather built that wall. And so back then you, you took the and how hard was it to plow that field, Charles? <laughs> they said they jumped from rock to rock. So, so that's what they did with the rocks. Same thing they did in Scotland. And that rock, by the way, Charles Rock and, and his neighbor William Ellis and Beth, uh, who were building a the house there now, they they had a house on Echo Jack. Echo Jack, where's Dan? Dan, you remember Echo Jack from class? It's a, it's a rock from the manor. It shouldn't be there. It's it's one of the few occurrences on Earth where a mantle rock is on surface, and it was driven there by seduction. And so it's very rare. And any of you have been on Redbud Road, north of Bakersfield? Most of you know where that is. You'll see vans parked up there by this rock in a, in a trailer. That's what they're looking at. But Charles and Mary and William and Beth live on that rock, live, live on that, uh, that huge outcrop of turn. Dan? What are those teeny tiny that rock, that rock, in some cases, can contain diamonds. And we're actually doing a study now where I sample the stream coming out of there for micro diamonds. The analysts aren't back yet. But you might want to make friends with Mary and Charles. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not very possible, but it's like, it, it, there's a small chance that that rock could be diamond bearing. Diamond band. And it may be just micro diamonds, which, which are so tiny you, you, you won't see one of those on somebody's painting. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I, I, I always remember that rock because I was Yes, they were connected. I'm going to show you. The question was she heard Lane and Scotland were connected at one time. Maybe. 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 Next slide. And of course, here again, the, the mountains rise. And then, you know, this could be the South Tower River. Right here. Next slide. Next slide. Where's that? <laughs> Our mountains. Our mountains. This was taken from the parkway by me about 10 years ago when the sun was just perfect. And then, of course, you've got, in the clouds up here, you've got Hawksville. Next slide. What, do, what, what drives all of this? What makes the mountains? What, what makes the mountains rise? What made Mount Mitchell? This is what does. It's plate tectonics, or, or continental drift, or C, C, C4 splitting, C4 rifting. And this is one of the really good 
slides I found. And if, if you look, you'll see the U.S. here. But these are the major plates on our surface. This is what drives the continents. All the continents are moving. Y'all ever feel the continent move? No, you're not going to feel it. But you'll feel it when it has a burp. And that's an earthquake. That's when two jam in and then they release. But what's, what's really driving what happens, what happened all along here on the, on the east coast of the U.S. and over in this part of Europe is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It's where the Atlantic Ocean splits. And it is split apart and it's a divergent continental margin. So the continents are moving apart from the middle, from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And there's an awesome little country where you can see this happen, right going up the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This is Europe, Scotland here, Ireland, England. What's this little country here? Iceland. Who's been to Iceland? Did you walk between the plates? Oh, that's on my bucket list, and I've got a picture of it, but it's, that's where the plates are separating, and you can walk right up the middle of the, of the mid Atlantic Ridge. And of course, most of the country's on fire. Uh, if it's not a glacier, if it's not ice, it's on fire. So it's a country on fire and ice. But this is, this is the Circle of the Pacific Ring of Fire, but all of these are, are major continental contacts, and you'll see that these are, uh, along these areas, especially along the west U.S. coast, major earthquake, major volcano areas because that's where the plates are splitting apart or they're jamming together. And before this started being a divergent continental margin, it was a convergent. So when it was coming together as Gondwana land was forming, it pushed our mountains up, Mount Mitchell. Road Mountain were all pushed up mountains that happened between 400 and 200 million years ago. I think that last, the last talk I did here was the geology of Mount Mitchell. Uh, and and it's, that's still a, an evolving story. Next slide, Bruce. This is the way I equate the speed of continental drift. Continental drift generally moves the speed of your fingernail growth. I slammed my finger in a door. You know that, that? I did it last week. <laughs> but this, this was black down here, and it took six months to grow here. So that's basically an analogy of how fast the plates are moving. Very, very slow, about three to four centimeters, five, six centimeters a year. But when you put that in millions and millions and hundreds of millions of years, it makes a lot of difference. But that's, that's how, about how fast the plates move. So that's how long that black took to get from there to there, six months. And then, my wife came out, why are you taking a picture of your finger? I said, well, use it in a slot. This again is, is continental separation. This is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It's mapped on the bottom of the ocean. And of course, you can see where it comes up and goes right through Iceland. So all of this and all of this used to be together. But it's still separating, getting further and further apart as we speak. At some point, it will stop and it may close back. Don't worry and wait for that. You won't be here. <laughs> Next slide. This is, this is the path. And you've been there. Pronounce that name. <laughs> but that's, this, is, this is the Eurasian plate. And this is the North American plate. So there's 230 feet of separation here. That separation happened in 10,000 years. It's still happening. That is still moving apart. And that's the continental divide where you can walk and touch and feel it. And just, uh, 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 if, if, if you go into Iceland, that's got to be a stop. Who, who's been on that trail? Y'all were on that trail? Tell us about it. It's amazing. Well, see, that's just 
10,000 years, so it's not a lot of erosion. That's, that's a small amount of time for erosion. But you can see these walls join. Those walls join and it's spread apart. You see any volcanoes? Very much like Yellowstone. Sheep. 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 Good. Those, those Europeans like sheep. Next slide. Around 430 million years ago, two small continents, one equating to modern Scandinavia and the other to the eastern seaboard of North America, slammed geologically speaking into each other, throwing up a vast mountain range similar in many respects to the modern Himalayas. At the height of the uplifting phase, the peaks may have increased even to 30,000 foot ceiling. From these ranges flow vast rivers, especially as Scotland was positioned somewhere over the equator. And at the time, in seasonal heavy rains would have brought significant flooding, depositing sands and gravels that would heavily influence the later geology of Northern Europe. How high was Mount Mitchell at one time? 30,000 feet. As high as the Himalayas. It's estimated to be 30,000 feet. It, that's, that's done by the rate and the age of weathering and the amount of sand and debris that's come off and filled actually the rivers and the coastal plain. So it, what we're seeing on Mount Mitchell is the nub, tiny root of a once lofty great mountain range. But over 300 million years, that's a lot of erosion. Mount Mitchell is not growing, it's diminishing. What's Mount Everest doing? It's growing. It's growing. It's growing about an inch every 10 years. What's going to happen to Mount Everest as it keeps growing? Dan? going to implode. Mount Everest will implode. It's reaching the point that the base of Mount Everest cannot support it anymore. So at some point, it will crumble. It will crumble. So if you're planning on taking a hike up and climbing Mount Everest, hopefully that won't happen when you're there. There are too many other things that will get you there anyway. But this is 200 million years ago before continental breakup. These are the Appalachians. The Appalachians are the brown material here. Look at this and look at this. Scotland and Ireland and Northern England. Norway. Antiochus Mountains, which is now Morocco. All mountainous areas, all once part of the Appalachians. This is the start of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge when the breakup was happening. You can go to, the mount, uh, to Grandfather Mountain. There's a trail up there. If you top, drop, hike the Crest Trail and come back down the Underwood Trail, there are cliffs there with boulders this big in there which were part of that breakup. Any of you been there? You've been to Grandfather Mountain and hiked that trail where the ladders are? Anybody done that? You have, and you go up to McCray's Peak, and then you come back around the bottom, and you see where the breakup of, 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 of the continent started. And those rocks are there at Grandfather Mountains. Just amazing. And if, you're not, if you've not hiked that trail as part of the Grandfather Mountain trail system, it's amazing. But if you're scared of heights, you'll never make it. <laughs> Will be. Because you go up ladders that are about 40 feet up, and then you wiggle across a little cliff with a rope and go up another ladder. Next slide. So this is where those came from. And of course all of this is weathered and been eroded, but these are your Appalachian remnants here, here, and here, here, and here. And it's amazing in the quartz business here. I was chief geologist for uh, First Park Corporation for 10 years. And we coveted the quartz here, the high purity quartz. Charles worked in that business. Anybody else work in that business? Charles worked in the lab at Gentleman. That is the highest purity quartz on Earth's planet. Uh, but the Norwegians would always say they had similar 
materials, similar high purity quartz. This part of all the way here. And they had similar conditions of formation, but they didn't have the depth of burial of the spruce pine pavement type that we had here. So we had purity. They say they had it. Let's go back, Bruce. They say they had it, but guess what? They come over here and get some from here and ship it over here. <laughs> That's why Quartz Court is owned one half by Emirates of Paris, France, and one half by Norwegian Crystal Line. So they, they bought the company because they couldn't find the rock. But this, this is part of when we talk about Scotland, where we came from, or did we really ever leave? These people that lived here in the same region of pre-Appalachian Mountains thought when they got over here and went down in here, it looked like home. It was the same place. It was the same place. The same origin. Same exact origin. Next slide. And we see evidence all over the place. When you're in Scotland, this is one of the little geology stocks. This is, this is like their North Carolina Museum of Minerals. And it's actually built in a neat landscape, but this is knocking crag. And this is talking about two geologists, early geologists, Peach and Horn, here they are. They were the first to discover major overthrust belts. And you know that our mountains were formed by overthrust belts, and we'll talk about that more in just a minute. Lots of that happened here. Where you live under your feet is an overthrust belt. Next slide. People from all over the world have puzzled over the rocks at Knock and Crag. Like you, they've wondered just how a layer of older rock ended up on top of layers of younger rock. Usually you find older rocks below younger ones. The answer, the older rocks have been shoved up and over the younger layers by massive forces deep within the earth. That massive force is, is tectonic movement. Those plates are moving and shoving and some shoved together. I wish I'd brought my little Lock models, but they break loose and then these older layers down here shove up over, over the younger layers. Uh, how many are familiar with the Grandfather Mountain window? Okay, it is. Dan is. How many of you are familiar with Case Cove? Who's been to Case Cove? Bring us. Describe Cave Cove. What, what does it look like when you go in there? It's like a bowl with mountains all around it. Exactly. A, a, a valley bowl with mountains surrounding it. That's the geologic window. When you're, when you're on the 226A, <clears throat> near the Switzerland Inn, or, or near, uh, oh, what's the lodge there? Big Lynn. If you're at Big Lynn, and you look down in the valley, you'll see the same bowl. I went to give a talk to the Marion Rotary Club on the geology of, of that area, and one guy stood up and said, yeah, that's where a giant meteor landed. <laughs> I said, where did you hear that? He said, I've always heard that. I said, no meteor. <laughs> but you get, those kind of, you get those kind of things happening all the time. But what happened was, is that the uh, 2.1, 2.2 billion year old Granville Rocks overrode that area and then a hole eroded in the middle. So that rim that you see looking into McDowell County in the Marion is a rim of older rocks with uh, young, older rocks with younger rocks on the bottom. Uh, it, when you, how many of you know of Baxter Pharmaceuticals? How many people work at Baxter Pharmaceuticals? About 2,000. About 2,000. Why did Baxter Pharmaceuticals come to McDowell County? Water. Because the water is limestone based. That's the shady dolomite. Same water that runs through Limbo Caverns. It's the same water up, up, up through there. The shady dolomite. Same, same Dolomite that's at the Woodlawn Quarry. If you buy rock for your driveway here in Mitchell County and it's white, it doesn't come from Mitchell County, it comes from down there because that's Dolomite limestone. Lots of things like that happen too here. Next slide. Peach and Horn, discovery of the Moyne Trust in 1907 
And that's when these were first discovered. It was a milestone in the history of geology as it was one of the first thrust belts ever discovered. It was discovered by Ben Peach and John Horn of the British Geological Survey. Moin thrust corroborated tectonic plate theory in that during the Caledonian orogeny, that was the mountain building of the Scottish Highlands and those other brown rocks that I showed you, of the Silurian 430 million years ago, Scotland was compressed as a European plate thrust westward over a thrust fault and above the ancient Lewisian gneiss of the Laurentian plate. So that was, that was a major overthrust there. Nobody could figure out what was going on there while these rocks were different from these rocks in Peach and Horn. And that's Peach and Horn. And this is my friend Dr. Bob Gannis when we were there. Bob is the leading graptolite expert in the world. Who knows what a graptolite is? That's a little fossil that's actually an animal that looks like a tiny microscopic fern. And you date other rocks by dating graptolites. And uh, Dr. Bob Gannis is the expert in the world on that. So he's, guess what he spends his, his days doing? Looking through microscopes. And he can pick those out. And when he sees a different species of those, he names them and he knows the date that that animal lived and can date the rock that it came from. Next slide. Edward Castle. This was a castle, and, and when you're over there, those that have been there, you see castles everywhere. And it's just a shame because some of them are, are ruins. They're just the ruins of what, what, what would have been just a tremendous place. And of course, this is all that's left. And when you look at this, you wonder, well, what would this have been like in its heyday? How, how, would, how would this have been? What would it have been like to live here? This is what it looked like, a reconstruction of what that was. And of course, you had your dungeon, you had your dining room, you had your bedrooms here, you had your attic, and your other bedroom. Just neat, neat places. But it gets so cold there, how would you heat that house? Honey, go turn the thermostat up. Next slide. This is a, this is a major dye base intrusion. These are, these are volcanic rocks that intruded granites in Scotland. So we're looking at this intrusion next to this lock, and it runs out through here. These are, these are everywhere in Virginia and the Piedmont of North Carolina. We see dye base intrusions everywhere. In fact, when I was with Vulcan Materials in Northern Virginia, Washington, D.C. area, several of our quarries were mining this dense, dark rock because it's very confident, very good. Uh, construction stone. And of course, when you go down the road, you see these warning signs everywhere. Next slide. And these guys are just all over the place. Next slide. <laughs> and some of them are just so neat. These are young ones. Next slide. Next. And of course, this is Dr. George Love. He was the uh, state geologist of Pennsylvania. And this is his granddaughter who got to go on these trips with him. Talk about a granddaughter getting to, get to go on neat trips. This is, and she will always remember her granddad at where he took her. Next slide. And of course, you see these guys, if you don't see sheep, you see the Scottish Highland cows. And what do they have similar to us? Next slide. Tommy Phillips Farm. Make that secret. We have Scottish cows. Harry cows, and most of you may not recognize that. That's, uh, that's, oh, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of that uh, pig. It's up in County. Yeah. This is Apple Mountain, and Grassy Creek Road 226 goes right over this hill. This is on the top of Tommy's farm, looking over toward Green Duncan's farm, if somebody knows where that, where that is. Uh, these are Highland cows in Spruce Mountain, and guess what? They're right on. Next slide. Mount Shahidian. Next photo of the Mount Shahidian, which is Gaelic for Fairy Hill in Caledonia. This is a mountain used in 1774 experiment by astronomer Roy Neil Maskeelin to detect the deflection of a pendulum by a mass of mount to determine the mean density of the Earth. And if, if you've taken physics, you remember this. 
that in the early days they figured out the mass of the earth by watching a, a pendulum being pulled by another mountain, by the gravity. But he and Charles Huffman came up with that. And while they were doing that, they also figured out a system, a survey system, to build contour lines. So this mountain is where contour lines were developed and where the mass of the earth was first, first, first figured out. And they weren't really far off. But as all of you know, when you look at contours on a map, this is where it came from, based on this next picture, this mountain. So this, this one right here is just a neat, neat place. Next slide. The next photo is of the Queen's View. When, when, when you that went to Scotland, did y'all go to any of these places? Did you go see the Queen's View? Because this is off a dirt road in the middle of nowhere. But there was a barite mine underneath it, so that's why we were there. But just a fabulous view. But the Queen in question was Victoria, and the site commemorates her visit in 1866. However, it is also claimed that the site was first named for Queen Isabel, wife of Robert and Bruce. Next slide. There's the Queen's view, and there's me in my orange outfit, so everybody can see it. But just a beautiful, beautiful countryside. And again, if, if our mountains were somewhat more devoid of trees, these would look identical landscapes. Next slide. So this is... It was, well, we, we asked that question, and I know anybody that's been to Scotland, there have been people living there for thousands of years. And so they eventually cut the trees and, and use them all uh, with population. And build ships, uh, and, and everything was wood. I was even uh, very surprised when we watched Notre Dame Cathedral burn. And a lot of it was wood. And it was centuries old wood, which they couldn't put out. It was so, it, it burnt so hot, it was so dry. It was, uh, when, when, when I left the house coming for another meeting, it was half burned up. Just about halfway burned. The rock walls. Yeah. And just a shame because a lot of other things in there burned up. But this is a barite deposit, and this was a, a run by the uh, Chevrolet J Company. They're, uh, they're a company that makes oil well materials. Barite is a very heavy mineral, so when you drill an oil well and you put all mud, you put mud in there, drilling fluid mud, to hold the weight down, so when you hit a gas pocket, it won't blow the mud out. Uh, this is the company that competes with Halberg. And so they're mining barite. Zemex Industrial Minerals used to have a barite mine in Murphy, North Carolina, and the rock came from Sweetwater, Tennessee, just right southeast of Knoxville. Very similar deposits. But we were making barite and putting it, selling it as, as powder, putting bowling balls. Did you know what made a bowling ball heavy? Barite. Barite is a heavy mineral, so you mix the plastic, the, the plastic mix with barite, and it makes the bone ball, ball heavy. It also was used for wall furniture. They would actually put it in the plastic of wall furniture to make the wall furniture a little heavier so it wouldn't blow away. How many of you had wall furniture blow away? <laughs> Everybody. But barite helps prevent that. But the next time you go bowling, tell your partner who why that bowling ball ball's heavy. Got barite in it. That's what they're mining here. Next slide. This is the barite mine. It's underground, and they were mining veins underneath. Um, also, whenever you go underground, you have to have one of these. Anybody know what that is? It's not a canteen. It's a self rescue. If there's a fire while you're underground, uh, it's the smoke and the gas that kills you. More underground disasters kill miners by fire and smoke than anything else. That's a self-rescuer. You pull that top off of this little breathing device and you breathe out of that. It gives you about an hour of breathing to get out of the mine. So you can breathe off that and not breathe the smoke. It's a self-rescuer. It saves your life. And to go in any underground mine, you have to have that. There's our group of geologists that were going up into that mine, all of those self-rescuers. And these are, really, you didn't get to go here. 
Nobody gets to go to these places, but we were there for that purpose, which was really neat to see those resources of the country. Next slide. And this is a, and you can see how this rock is dipping. That's from the mountains being pushed up and contorted. If you drive through the tunnels on the parkway, you see the same type rock, especially at the at the tunnel of, of Wild Acres and Little Switzerland. You'll see those those uh, tilted strata rock roots. Same thing there. Next slide. And then here's more of the picturesque areas. Next. And they have a lot of these. Do we have that? Rhododendron, beautiful plant. Next slide. Look how beautiful. This is on Rome Mountain. Next slide. Rome Mountain, our gardens. People from Scotland come here to see ours. Next slide. And of course, this is the, this is the river at Balmoral. I mean, that setting could be the South Tower River all over again. And most of you know what that's like. At Balmoral. Next slide. And they have pottery places everywhere. Next slide. Next slide. It may, it, it'll catch up. And we. It jumped ahead. That was it. And we have pottery places. Any any Tow River Arts people here? Susan, recognize this? Those are new, aren't they? They're great. I like them. This is my neighbor, Linda Charlotte. And of course, lots of potters here. Lots of potters over there. They like it. Next slide. And this is another castle we visited. 500 year history. Next slide. New Park Castle. Park Castle existed during the reign of William the Lion, 1165 to 1214, or Loch Ness. It was involved in the wars of independence of the Lord of Isles in the 15th and 16th centuries, in the Jacobite rising of the 17th and 18th centuries. The castle is currently in the care of Historic Scotland and is the site of most of the reporting sightings of Nessie. Who's Nessie? Anybody ever seen Nessie? We saw it when we were there. Next slide. We were riding on the bus. And of course, this is the castle. There's Loch Ness. Go back to that. Everybody see that? We were playing around and I stuck my finger up and the guy next to me on the bus took a big. That's usually the sighting of Nancy. That's usually what Nancy is. <laughs> But that's, that, that, did, did most of you go to Loch Ness? Have you seen Loch Ness? Just a neat place. Did you go to this castle? Just amazing places. Next slide. In the history of those. And of course, these are. this is a slate quarry uh, in about the middle of the highlands. And these, this slate is just like the Arvonia slate out of Charlottesville, Virginia. You couldn't tell them the difference. You couldn't tell the difference. Uh, this is Dr. Stan St uh, Krakowski. Stan and Dennis, the other guy that I showed in the orange suit, they developed the Boy Scouts of America Mining Merit Batch. They were the ones that put it together and submitted it and got it approved. It's only about five years old. Uh, but Stan is from Oklahoma. He's the Oklahoma State Geologist. And these are bedding plants. So he's, he's acting like he's asleep because he's on the bedding plate. And so these were formed flat as sediments in water, and then as the mountains were being created from tectonic push, they were pushed up like that. They're almost vertical. But these are slate, slate mines in Scotland, actively being mined, just like the Arvonia slate in Arvonia, Charlottesville, Virginia. How many of you have slate roofs? Brenda, you have a house that had a slate roof, did you? slate roof at one time. It may have had a slate roof. Because, and they were really heavy. This was really heavy, but it, your shingles never wore out. How many of you had shingles that wore out? <laughs> These shingles don't wear out. They, I bet they were. And they probably came from Charlottesville, Virginia. They probably 
probably didn't come from here. Next slide. And if these are granite quarries, we visited those granite quarries very Senator Hansen, who has operations here, is based in England. And we actually went to the lady's house that owned Hansen. Huge, huge house that we had dinner there. She was also the sheriff. Remember the sheriff of Nottingham? They still have those sheriffs, but they don't really have a role. They have a name, but they don't have, they, they, uh, they don't go out and arrest anybody or kill Robin Hood. <laughs> the reason the quarry is around this, this is an old Roman fort. So there are, there are signs of Roman activity there everywhere. And especially as you get the Hadrian's Wall. Next slide. And this next slide is of an a underground gypsum mine owned by British Gypsum, the division of St. Nobain. This mine is very similar to the gypsum deposits in Atlantis near Saltville, Virginia. How many of you have been to Saltville, Virginia, near Aberdeen? That area was mined, and it's starting to peter out, but it was mined for gypsum for years and years and years, and salt. Same kind of mine, same kind of material. But this is a British gypsum mine. Next slide. Here we are on the ground. And these little crickly things, that's gypsum. And it's an evaporite, it's an anhydrite that forms in desert type positions and then it keeps getting buried. It's almost like forming salt. But they were mining the gypsum from these deposits here, which is calcium sulfate, which is used for lots of things. Especially, what in this room is made out of gypsum? She brought it. That's where she brought it comes from. Calcium sulfate. Next slide. And that's a gypsum crystal, a selenite gypsum crystal. Next slide. And this is their plant, just a beautiful plant out, uh, out in the lands of northern Scotland. Next slide. And then there's, everywhere you go you see cathedrals and churches that have been burnt. And so, just like what we were talking about another day, only the walls are standing. These are just walls because kings or, or lords would get mad at somebody who's come burn your castle or burn your church or burn your cathedral. It happened a lot. But this is Jedburgh, which is geologically famous in the world. Next slide. Revolutionary rocks. And they're revolutionary because it, it, it's controversial and it was revolutionary at the time. Rocks near Denver are internationally famous among geologists. They play a key role in shaping our understanding of the earth and how it was formed thanks to the inspired scientific work of Berwickshire gentleman farmer called James Hutton. Next slide. These were rocks that he discovered on a, on a, on a creek in the area where he lived where you had rocks that were vertical and then you had rocks that were horizontal. So he supposed, and he, he devised and wrote the theory of superposition and the fact that these rocks were turned up vertical, either continental thrusting was not known at that time. They didn't know what did it. But the thrusting turned these rocks up, and then later sediments <coughs> came down, cut them off, and buried them. So how can these rocks here and these rocks formed quickly. How could they have formed quickly? And so that was his, his theory, which was controversial. Next slide. And that's where the outcrop was along this crater. It's, it's covered now, so you can't see it. But there's, there are plaques everywhere about that deposit. Next slide. At the time, many people accepted the Bible story of how the earth was created in six days. Even those who thought that this could be taken literally, reckon the earth was at most a few thousand years old. Hutton's ideas published in the book Theory of the Earth in 1795 were as much of a challenge to the way people understood the world as those of Darwin. And on evolution 64 years later, they were also just as important in the laying foundations of modern science. So a lot of people there, and a lot of people here, don't believe that these things happen. In, 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 in long, long millions of years. So it was controversial back then. Uh, very controversial, and it still is. Next slide. Adrian's Wall, Fort Houses. 
Adrian's Wall was a Roman barricade wall of 73 miles long, built 2,000 years ago during the second century by the Romans to keep the Scots out of England. Those pesky Scots. This is a World Heritage Site in the location of Fort Houston, which is recognized as the most complete example of a Roman fort. In Britain, and one of the best known for the entire Roman Empire. It was one of the many forts built along the wall and about every five miles to house Roman soldiers got in the wall. Next slide. And of course, this is part of the Fort Foundation and, and Hadrian's Wall. Next slide. And this was Antonine Wall, which was a little later, and this was Hadrian's Wall built across here. Because the Romans didn't like, of course, the Scots moving in and plundering them. Uh, it really didn't work. Next slide. And there's the foundation of the fort. These are the only things that were left after 2,000 years. But look at the rock work in here. And they didn't have really any tools to speak of. Next slide. And this is where the forts were located. But the Scots would figure out ways in between where they couldn't see them from the fort. So the forts were really useless. Didn't do, do, do very good at all because the Scots would come in and, and, and raid them anyway. But the, but the Romans weren't afraid of it. They were afraid to go in here because they were such warring people. And, and when we talk about warring people, look what happened with over Mount Victory Trail. Those Scots from, from the Highlands, from Avery County, from Yancey County, from Mitchell County, from Southern Virginia, they heard that, they, that, that Cornwall had sent a regiment up to to kill them and burn their houses. So what did they do? They weren't going to take that. They went across Hadrian's Wall, went down there and whooped them. Uh, and most of you that know the story of, of the Over Mount Victory Trail, that's what happened. Uh, these people weren't going to have uh, somebody like Ferguson come up and, and, and get them right naked. Mm -hmm. Very similar people. It's the same people. Your ancestors. Next slide. And this is the foundations of, the, uh, of the, one of the forts in just a beautiful area. These were their wells. Next slide. Brenda, what was this? Did you? Who, who's been here? Who's been to Adrian's Wall into this fort? I didn't see that fort. You have? You remember what this is? This is amazing. It's, yes, it's a latrine. It's their bathroom. The Romans were really good at water systems and, and they knew how to pipe water, they knew how to handle water, they knew how to dam water. But look at the next slide is a recreation of what this would have been. So look at this. Go back, Chris. You went too fast. <laughs> that's okay. Look at this right here, this trough. In this trough over here. Next slide. That's what this was. This was their latrine. And, and so th th this is still here after 2,000 years. What was this? That's their toilet paper. <laughs> so, next time you use your toilet paper, be thankful you didn't have to use a stick with something right around it. <laughs> but that's, uh, that's uh, go back to the previous slide, Bruce. That's what this was at one of the forts. An elaborate system 2,000 years ago. Next slide. Next slide. Balmoral has been one of the residents from members of the British royal family since 1852. When the state and its original castle were purchased privately by Prince Albert, consort to Queen Victoria, it remains as the private property of the royal family and is not property of the crown. How many have been to Balmoral? Did you get to go in? Yeah. Yeah. We got to go in too. Just a Beautiful place. Just, uh, and, and, and a lot of people don't understand this is where the queen comes from the summer. You know all those Florida people that come up here for the summer? The queen does that too. This is where she stays and this is where the family stays in the summer. And when we were there, one of our guys even told us that the queen, every once in a while, she'd just get in her car and drive around. And it was safe for her to drive there. And she stopped and helped a, a couple change their tire one time. And they, they said, oh, it's the, 
Are you really an appointment? <laughs> <laughs> What's an appointment open from time to time? Next slide. Where is this? Let's say it up. Back up one, Bruce, please. Very simple. Next slide. Very simple. Next slide. That's the back side of that wall. You thought that was better than the house, too, didn't you? They're just very similar. And the gardens are beautiful. Next slide. There's Deb. There's my queen outside her castle. Next slide. For the day. And these are some of the gardens at Balmoral. I don't think the queen goes out there and digs weeds. Because there are other people out there doing that for them. Next slide. Just beautiful gardens and greenhouses, just, just like at Melbourne. Next slide. And of course, the mountains. This is Balmoral, and there's the South Toe River next to Balmoral. <laughs> next slide. And then you get this. For you that have been to Scotland, did you pass any of this? These are the gypsies. And you might like gypsies, but these people over here don't like them. Uh, they they leave trash everywhere. And we saw it. Uh, you know, the people were telling us, well, they're, they're over there now. Don't go over there. But when we were driving, we were driving right where they were, so we saw them and saw the caravan. But they live in these. They live in these wagons. But where they go, they leave a lot of trash. I don't know why they would make a bad name for themselves, but they do. Did any of you see that? Any of you see the gypsies right over there? Yes. And, and they're in other parts of Europe, too. Thanks. Anybody here are gypsies? <laughs> we have gypsies in Mitchell County, too, don't we? In Mitchell But again, this is their house. This is their stove. And, and just, I, I'm just fascinated with them. And then you're driving down the road, and you meet them, and they're being, those wagons are being pulled by horses. Next slide. Just like this. That's our, those are our vans. Passing the gypsies. Next slide. Kosherville. The next slide is of the village of Kosherville. It's one of the possible birthplaces of Pontius Pilate. And you know, if you think, and you know about Pontius Pilate and his biblical story, but how did he get to the biblical area where the Romans occupied here? So it very well could have been a place that Pontius Pilate was from. And he's depicted as being from several places, and this is one of them. It is also the home of the new tree, which is estimated to be about 5,000 years old, and may be the world's oldest living thing, pictured with his granddaughter Annabelle, Pennsylvania State Geologist, George Love. Next slide. And that's in the cemetery next to there. And their cemeteries are different. These headstones are huge. I love them all. I think this was a poor guy here. Next slide. And there's the new tree. Huge tree. Next slide. Before you stand Europe's and possibly even the world's oldest living thing under the dark veil of needles are two relic trunks of a huge ancient new tree. Scholars believe the roots of this giant survivor go back some 5,000 years. Any of you see that? Did y'all go through that area? Isn't that neat? Just a neat place. And that's in rural, rural Scotland. Next slide. There's part of our group, we would just be out in the field and we would have lunch on these rocks. And these rocks were special. They're just everywhere. These rounded rocks and these boulders. And they're called, next slide, Roshit Monk Names, uh, which are often occurring groups or swarms, these rocks, which are like granite. In 1787, H.B. Desusher thought the groups of rounded rocks resembled the wavy wigs or monk names which men wore at the time. Slipped down with button towel and gave these rocks more of the name of Roshi rock with wigs. And so you can see that in our founding fathers had those. And of course, what were all those sheep for? Make grease for your hair. <laughs> Next slide. Morefield coin. The Lewisian nice overthrust the Duras limestone with two billion years of separation along the fault. In this case, the much older formation of gneiss has been shoved over the limestone, just like Lindell Falls. This is the same type of geologic thrusting that formed the Grandfather Mountain window in Marion, 
were older farm sites were thrusted over the younger livestock with a half a billion years of separation. Remember that, Dan? When we were, when we were over there at Level Fall Fall. You can go and see this fall and you can touch it. I'm sorry, I thought I had to turn that off. Uh, the Marion Limestone Chain Dolomite is currently being mined by the explosive supply company and is known as the Woodlawn Park. Next slide. This is the Louisian Nice. There's two billion years of separation along this line of the overlying limestone. So this was an overthrust. It was thrust over where you've got two billion years difference in this age and this age. Next slide. And this is the bedding plane. This is the limestone. This is the nice. Very different. And this is at a quarry where they quarry this type of stone granite for one thing and the limestone for another thing. Next slide. Just like the Grandfather Mountain window, where the Limbo Falls fall, thrusted rocks up and over these younger rocks. There's Table Rock. There's Wiseman's, Wiseman's View. It's right here. This is Limbo Gorge. There's Table Rock. Table Rock was pushed up there from over here. So those rocks on Table Rock came from over here and were shoved over. So it's just sitting there like a stack of books on top of a pedestal or a table. But then the rim of these older rocks encompass the grandfather mountain window, which is this here. But this is Limbo Falls Fall and Table Rock Fall. Next slide. And this is the Limbo Falls Fall. This is what you see at Limbo Falls. There was a really nice exhibit that was put there two years ago by the Park Service, but a flood wiped it out. The sign, I think, is still lit, uh, sitting there. But this is the fall gal. This is the Granville Basement. This is 2.1 billion year old rock. This is the Shady Dolomite. It's about 400 million years old. This is the same, uh, I'm sorry, this is the Chill High Sandstone right here. But this is the fault gal where the two faults ground past each other. Next slide. Juris limestone is mostly dolomitized, which means it's high magnesium, which is used as an important source for agriculture lime. The lime is used in Esther Ross, the Morning Earth area, and the Black Isle for neutralizing the soils on which barley and other crops are grown. What do they do with barley in Scotland? What? Yes. What's scotch? There's barley. Next slide. And that's what it makes. And these places are all over. A lot of these distilleries and, and uh, barley places are here. Just all over the place. Next slide. And of course, you can buy you can buy one of these. You can get it home. <laughs> Next slide. And then of course the the roadways in the countryside are just amazing. These are ski slips. Ski lifts and just like 226A, the rattlesnake, they have motorcycle roads here. You see them everywhere. You see the, uh, the European bikes all over. Next slide. Highland Games are events held throughout the year in Scotland and other countries in ways celebrating Scottish and Celtic culture, and especially that of the Scottish Highlands. Certain aspects of the game are so well known as to have become the thematic of Scotland such as bagpipes and the kill, and the heavy events, especially the caper toss. While centered on co competitions in piping and drumming, dancing, Scottish heavy athletics, games also include entertainment and exhibits related to aspects of the Scottish Catholic culture. How many of you been to the Highland Games in Grandfather Mountain? If you haven't been, it's, it, it, it's something you can't miss. You can't miss going and seeing that. The Cow Island Gatherings, better known as the Cow Games, held in Dunedin, Scotland every August, is the largest Highland Games in the world, attracting around 3,500 competitors, somewhere in the region of 23,000 spectators. I think 23,000 spectators go to the Highland Games and grab on the mountain. Have you ever tried to drive through there when that's going on? <laughs> it's bad. Worldwide, however, it is seated in terms of spectators by two gatherings in the United States to estimate 30,000 that attend Grand Fondo Mountain in North Carolina. And even the larger gathering, the largest one in our Northern Hemisphere, is hosted by the Caledonian Club in San Francisco. 
But really, you get to your Scottish roots and you can see your family names if you go to Scottish Gate. How many people here have a Scottish based name? Not half the crowd. Exactly. Next slide. It is reported in numerous Highland Games programs that King Malcolm III of Scotland in the 11th century summoned contestants to a foot race to the summit of Craig Cone. Overlooking Braylon. King Malcolm created this foot race in order to find the fastest runner in the land to be his royal messenger. Some have seen this event to be the origin of the modern Highland Games. So the kings would have these athletes compete. He would pick the fastest and the toughest to be his messenger. So that was the result of that. This is Bramer. Next slide. This is Bramer. What does this look like? It looks like a prey field. It looks like a prey field in Highland, in Highland Games and Grandfather Mountain. But this is Bramer. Next slide. This is Bramer. Next slide. This is a prey field. Right next door to us in Taylor County. Just a minute. Just a minute. Spectacular event. Next slide. How many of you have seen this the opening of Highland Games when the bagpipes come down through there in number? It makes your spine tingle, doesn't it? That's probably just an amazing, amazing thing to see. And if you haven't seen this, you ought to join those people who haven't seen the top of the table wall. <laughs> Next slide. And of course, this is the Highland Games. What is this? It's a cable. I thought it was a telephone pole. <laughs> I couldn't even pick up one end of this. What they do with the caper calls, this is laying on the ground. They come pick it up, and a guy kind of helps them get it to the top. And then the idea is to run and flip that and flip it all the way over, and it has to fall that way. If it falls 12 o'clock, the closest to 12 o'clock wins. If it's two, if it goes this way and falls this way, you're in bad shape. It's got to toss here and fall that way. Any of you ever done that? <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen the guys that do that in the holiday day? I can't imagine. Next slide. The games are claimed to have influenced Barry Pierce to keep near when he was planning the, the revival of the Olympic Games in Cabrera, if I said that right, say a display of Highland Games, saw a display of Highland Games at the Paris Exhibition in 1989 and started the Olympic Games. And this is in the courtyard at St. Andrews, and while I was over there, I bought a kilt. A Scotland wool kilt. And it's actually heavy. Uh, uh, and I started to wear it tonight, and I thought I'd be the only one in here with it. <laughs> but it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's just a neat place, and these were some of our hosts here. And uh, just such a neat, neat place. But the, the, the title of the topic, the topic of the talk, of course, is there's so many similarities here uh, with the people and the physiographic and the geology because it was the same place. It was the same place. And so you still see mountain people that, that are like this. And some people make fun or, uh, of mountain people, but they're some of the smartest people I've ever met. Some of the smartest people I've ever met. And it took that to live here. And you've seen some of the history of those people. Charles, your grandparents, I mean, they had a hard time clearing that field. They could have gone down to Winston-Salem and not had any rocks to throw out of the field. So what brought them here? You know, why, did, why did they come? Any other questions? That's, that's the end of the program about Scotland. Why don't we have any natural lakes? Because there were no glaciers. No glacier. And a lot of people think that glaciers came here and a lot of people here that Mount Mitchell was pushed up by a glacier, or the, uh, the, the rocks in Sparta, uh, some of those rocks were cleaned by glaciers. No glacier ever came south of the Pennsylvania Maryland border. None. Pre-glacial did. It pushed some of the fauna forward, but no glacier evidence is ever here. And it's those glaciers that carve out those big hillworks and those big rocks. It's not 
that yes, yeah, and especially in the past they have. You still see some snow areas. I don't think there's an active glacier there. You go to Iceland and see them, but glaciers which are receding worldwide were what carved those out. And you see a lot of those, you see glaciated lakes in the northwest of this country. Yes? That's glacial teal, those boulders. And if you go, if you drive up into Pennsylvania and go all up in there, you see the round rocks everywhere. And the rock, the uh, glacial teals, just everywhere. All over the place. But you won't find them here because they didn't exist. There was a professor at Appalachian State that found evidence of a glacier on uh, Stone Mountain over near Mount Airy. Because there were grooves in the rock where he thought the rocks were part of the mountain and wrote a report on it. Later they found out they were logging chains. <laughs> <laughs> so he's kind of still made fun of them. And I know that professor. He was a good professor, but he made a little mistake. Yes. Can you tell me where it's not when cannons come from? Where what came from? The cannon name. I didn't hear you. You can't. Uh, can't no. Can. But my wife's the one, and she's as warring as you can get. <laughs> you know those warning people from Scotland? My wife is a, a Vance, a McKinney, and a McKinney. Really? And I get the bad end of that sometimes. Don't I, Mary? Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you. If you have any other questions, uh, come forward and thank you.